This episode brought to you by the Neurodiversity University, a new division of the Neurodiversity Alliance, home of the Neurodiversity Podcast. Check out strategies for supporting twice exceptional students, a continuing education and professional development course for educators and school districts from Emily Kircher Morris, author of Teaching Twice Exceptional Learners in Today's Classroom. For details, go to neurodiversity.university. What is neurodiversity? What is it about these people? Dyslexia. Autism spectrum. ADHD. Gifted. Dysgraphia. All brains are different. It's okay to be who you are. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Episode 107. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and this week we are highlighting some of our most downloaded episodes from 2021. Today's episode features a conversation with the host of the ADHD Essentials podcast about rejection sensitivity. As we wrap up 2021, it is so exciting to see the neurodiversity movement continue to gain steam. One way that we are hoping to push forward this cause is with the creation of a new venture, the Neurodiversity University. This online hub will be a source for virtual courses for educators, mental health professionals, and of course, parents. If you want to stay in the loop about all of these future offerings, hop on over to neurodiversity.university and sign up for our newsletter. That's neurodiversity.university, not .com, to get all the info. Let's get started. To help you understand rejection sensitivity in neurodivergent people, we brought in some reinforcements. My name is Brendan Mahan. I'm an ADHD coach, consultant, and speaker, and host of the ADHD Essentials podcast. Stay right there for a revisit of a fascinating conversation, next. Hi, I'm Dave Morris, the executive producer of this podcast. Putting together something like this is a huge endeavor, from planning and booking guests, to putting together the finished product, to buying equipment, even traveling to get the stories we present. It's a lot of work. As twice exceptional parents of three 2E kids, My wife Emily and I wanted to start this podcast so we could share our experiences and help others along the way. So my request is this. If you get some benefit from our podcast, would you consider becoming a Neurodiversity Podcast patron? Just a dollar or two a month can really add up, and not only would you be helping defray costs, you become eligible for some members-only perks. Listening to our podcast is a free experience, and it always will be. Shipping in will help us continue bringing compelling content to listeners around the world. Go to patreon.com slash neurodiversity or go to neurodiversitypodcast.com and click support at the top of the page. And thanks. Today we're talking to Brendan Mahan of the ADHD Essentials podcast. And so, Brendan, we're so glad to have you back. Yeah, I'm glad to be to be back. I'm glad to be on. So we've had some requests from some listeners to dive into this concept of rejection sensitivity. And it's something that I think is often talked about within the context of ADHD. And we'll get to those reasons in a moment. But I thought it might be important to mention rejection sensitivity isn't exclusive to ADHD. And I think it might be useful probably for us to go ahead and define what do we even mean by that? Like, what is rejection sensitivity? I, I, I think this is one of the times when the name really does a good job of the heavy lifting, right? Like it's mm-hmm. you experience rejection more intensely than folks who are neurotypical, right? You are sensitive to rejection. It's, it's kind of like you are the tooth that reacts strongly to the cold when you drink a ice water or something, right? Like it's exceptionally impactful for you when you are rejected for whatever reason. And then that also leads into anxiety around being rejected at some point in the future. Like if I do this, are people not going to like me? And it can lead to a lot of people pleasing. Um, It can lead to some of that sort of imposter syndrome and feeling like you don't fit in and you don't belong and, and those sorts of things. So many people resonate with this when they first read about rejection sensitivity or hear about it. But it's interesting to consider how it does impact neurodivergent folks more or in a different way than neurotypical people. I think a lot of it comes down to trauma. A lot of it comes down to when you're neurodivergent, you don't fit in as well for a myriad of reasons. It could be that you're socially awkward. 
It could be that you're not as capable of meeting expectations as someone who is neurotypical. It could be that you just don't get it. Like some of our neurodivergent folks are like things that matter to other people don't matter as much to them. So they're not really clear on why it's upsetting. I've got a, I've got a buddy who like, you can say just about anything to him and he's not going to be offended. Like he just is not easily offended at all. (laughs) Consequently, he spends time saying stuff to people that is horrifically insulting and he doesn't get it. Like he doesn't have the part of his brain that's like, you can't call people that. Like you can't, you can't say that to people because if someone said that to him, he wouldn't be bothered by it. It's not even a power move on his part. It's just that he doesn't process that as something that would be upsetting or hurtful because almost nothing that is said to him, he experiences as upsetting or hurtful. Um, so I know he said stuff just cause he liked the way it sounded <laughs> and he was like, Oh, that's like, I shouldn't say that. I'm like, no, what are you doing? He's like, I don't know. It's just like the way it sounds. It's fun to say. I'm like, what's wrong, dude, you can't. <laughs> and like, he's, I've known this guy since high school. So like, I think part of why we got along was I was a good buffer for him. Like he would kind of push me forward cause he just did stuff. And I didn't, I was like, you can't like socially, you can't do that. Like, I know all these rules that you don't seem to recognize, but I had more rules than I needed to have because that was kind of my sensitivity around rejection was I was like, there's a hundred thousand rules of social stuff that you should follow to avoid being rejected. Um, So he and I kind of were a good foil for each other. You were compensating Mm -hmm. with all of those rules that you had come up with. You were, had internalized those things and, and were protecting yourself. And that becomes tricky, right? Because when when you're sensitive to rejection and you have developed more rules or observed more rules than are really there, right? Because I'm sure I observed something in, that happened in one instance and I extrapolated that to forever. Like this is how it always has to go, even though it made sense in that instance, but it probably didn't make sense in other instances. And it becomes hard to navigate all of that. It becomes tricky to like, oh, well, there's a thousand rules. And also... You assume that these rules are known by everybody. So then when other people aren't following those rules, it can be pretty upsetting. I know I struggled with that as a kid, kind of got over it. And now with COVID, I'm back in that mold a little bit where I'm kind of like, I'm the guy who's like, why aren't you wearing masks? Why aren't you doing six feet of distancing? Like, we know the rules. These aren't even rules that I like... (laughs) think I figured out by ob- way of observation when I was 12. This is like on the news, everyone said so kind of rules, like the doctors are telling us this. Um, it's a kind of a combination of deeply offended and surprised when people aren't practicing those rules. Like if I'm in the line at the grocery store and someone is right up my butt, I'm like, what are you doing, man? Like back up six feet. But how do I express that in a way that isn't me the turning into the jerk somehow, and that's that same rejection sensitivity stuff. I don't want to offend this person, even though I'm offended and maybe my health is at risk. I don't want to offend this person and by telling them to back up, right? Right. So it's interesting the kind of positions it can put you in. <laughs> you don't want to be the one who's getting rejected because you're breaking the rules, but also you don't want to be the one enforcing <laughs> the rules because you may then be rejected. So it's this this tightrope. Yeah. Rejection also, I, I feel like, is a That's a big word. Mm -hmm. But I think what we're also really talking about when we talk about the sensitivity is that it can be something that is much more subtle, maybe even what some might consider just mild criticism. You know what? The best example I have of like the subtle rejection sensitivity like that you're talking about that everyone experiences, just about like 90% of folks I'm sure have had this moment happen to them. It's when your boss goes... I need to talk to you. And like you panic because you're like, oh my God. That incredibly like visceral response that you have to someone in power saying, I need to talk to you, whether it's your boss or your spouse or whoever it might be. Everybody has kind of experienced that at least once. For people who are sensitive to rejection, that's like all the time. We're having that kind of over response to little things on a pretty regular basis. And it's it's everything from asking to hang out with someone and and then and they're like, no, I have like I have stuff to do, which probably they do, but you're assuming 
that, oh, well, why they just don't hang out with me? Instead of making the assumption that they have stuff to do, which is literally what they told you, <laughs> a person who's sensitive reje to rejection is often going to like decide that that person doesn't like them anymore or can't stand hanging out with them more than once a month or something, which isn't necessarily the case. Yeah. One of the things I work with my clients on is paying attention to the story that they're telling themselves. Because if I ask someone to hang out and that person is like, I can't, even if that's all the information I get, right? I can't hang out with you on Tuesday. I'm like, oh, I can tell whatever story I want in that moment. And if I'm, and I'm going to, because I'm a human and people tell stories, it's just how we process information. So if I can tell any story that I want, I may as well pick a story that serves me as opposed to one that undermines me. So a lot of my clients are telling the story of that person doesn't like me. That person can't handle spending more than two days a week with me or two days a month or whatever, or they, they've secretly hated me their whole entire life, <laughs> however intense the story gets, right? But it might also be totally valid that this person is sick and doesn't want to get us sick. It could be that this person has an assignment due or a project at work and they know they're going to be busy on Tuesday, but they can't talk about it because it's a top secret project. It could be that this person just doesn't like hanging out with people on Tuesday. <laughs> maybe that maybe they don't want it to become a regular thing because they always accidentally say see you next Tuesday and they don't want to offend anyone because they have rejection <laughs> sensitivity too. So they never <laughs> hang out with people on Tuesday. Like that could be why. I don't know. But making up a ridiculous story like that is better for me because now I'm not assuming they don't like me. And it's just as right because I don't know what the truth is. It's interesting that there is so much that is connected with this social communication piece. If I've had experiences in, in the past where I have misinterpreted something and made myself even too intense, like, oh, well, they said they couldn't hang out with me this day, so I'm going to ask them the next day and the next day and the next day, when maybe I should have backed off, there can be kind of an overcompensation. I think it's interesting also, though, to consider how the social communication piece is so impacted by social media and texting where you don't have a lot of those other clues mm -hmm. and then exponentially affected by where we are right now with the pandemic and how that has shifted our relationships. I have gotten better at communicating because of social media, specifically Facebook Messenger. Because I'll have friends talk to me about like some sensitive stuff. And I have to ask questions because there's no body language. There's nothing. It's just words. So I, I've gotten better at asking more pointed, more specific questions without coming across as judgmental or a jerk. Um, and it's made me a better communicator overall because I, I'm very aware of the information that I'm not getting and don't have when it's a text-based one, whether that's uh, Facebook Messenger or texting or even over email. Um, Although email is not as the same kind of like rapid response thing that, that the other two have. And because I'm so aware of what information I don't have, I've gotten better at not assuming that I have information when I'm talking to people in person. Because a, a piece of avoiding rejection sensitivity is get the information, which can be hard because you're afraid of being rejected for asking too many questions, and that's valid. Um, but also, if you're asking good questions, you probably don't need to worry about it. And the other situation is all of the stuff with COVID, that's having a huge impact on people's re rejection sensitivity, right? Because just not seeing folks for a year, those relationships feel unstable and untenable and, and you feel like you're being rejected by folks, even though you're not, like we're all in the same position, at least those of us who are sort of doing the social distancing and social isolation stuff, because I recognize not everyone is, but those of us who are, it can feel uncomfortable. It can be like, I haven't talked to this person in a year. What do I do with them? Like, that's a piece of it. And also, do they really like me? And am I like going to be okay in responding to them? How's that going to work? Even hearing like over social media, right? That two friends you haven't seen in a year have interacted in some way. Mm -hmm. And now I know I've had that moment where I'm like, well, how come I haven't interacted with those two friends? Do they like each other better than they like me? Which is silly. Like, that's not what happened. It's just everybody's in this weird situation that's un unlike anything we've ever done before. And sort of zooming in even more, or maybe flipping this on its head, 
There's also the people, if you are socially isolating and distancing and all that stuff, you've got folks in your house that you're spending, in some cases, 24 hours a day, seven days a week with. Yeah. I know for me and my kids, that's where we are. And my boys are really sensitive to rejection from mom and dad. There's a lot of like, sorry, 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 sorry. If we get a little like, what are you doing? It doesn't even have to be a raising of a voice thing. It's the the mildest of criticism because we're most of their social network. We're there all the time. So if we reject them, what does that mean? How hard is the day going to be if we're mad at our kids for 12 hours or whatever? Which means in our family, we're doing like apologies and forgiveness early and often. Like that's how we maintain our relationships and keep things strong. And I make those efforts to make sure they're having social connection and doing stuff. They hung out with some friends last weekend. They, I run a Dungeons and Dragons game for them every Thursday for my boys and to four of their friends. So they're getting the social connection piece. But this is a, it's, it's tricky all the way around. There's so many new variables, even a year in, that we're trying to manage. It's interesting how you mentioned that communicating and questioning in written form has been good for you. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like, I do a much better, (laughs) because of my job, my job is to ask people questions. Mm -hmm. For example, I was talking to a client the other day. I was talking to a parent of a client, and we were talking about some things that were probably hard to hear for that parent, not necessarily in a bad way or that they were going to be angry, but just trying to integrate that. And they got this uh, an expression on their face that I could tell was a mix of kind of some confusion But I think in the past, I would have probably interpreted that as, oh, they're mad at me. They are upset with this information that I'm sharing. And I would have almost avoided having that difficult conversation. But I've gotten much better at trying to almost take the information that is being communicated non-verbally and only attributing it the value that it deserves. (laughs) It's not everything. And then asking the explicit questions or gathering more information before I make a judgment. And I I feel like that has helped me, at least in that arena, deal with some of that rejection sensitivity, because I'm not automatically jumping to that conclusion that somebody's upset with me. Yeah. And that's the story part, right? Like, what's the story you're telling yourself? Is the story you're telling yourself that this person doesn't like you and doesn't want to be talking to you? Or is the story that that face is they're confused or that they're upset by the problem you're talking about, not upset by you? Mm -hmm. The less we take things personally, the easier it is to manage some of this rejection sensitivity. But that's hard, right? Because of the trauma that's inherent in neurodiversity. Like I was saying earlier, we just get rejected more because we fail at stuff more. And failing doesn't have to mean rejection, but we often interpret it that way because- When you're young, criticism feels like failure. Criticism feels like rejection. Because you're young and you don't have enough experience yet to know that that's not the case. And you just carry that. Yeah. And you keep carrying it because you get rejected that much more and you, or you get rather you fail that much more. So you're experiencing it as rejection that much more, even though that's not really what's going on. And that leads to stronger responses, which leads to maybe actual rejection because you're behaving in a way that's not appropriate and people don't want to spend time with you because you're a gloomy Gus or always angry or whatever your particular response is. You know, when I look back on my childhood and being twice exceptional, and so I was, you know, in the gifted program, but I was also ADHD. And I often question if I was also, was, am, on the autism spectrum, because social cues a lot of times are kind of confusing (laughs) for me. Mm -hmm. And when I look back at a childhood, I used to have these really big meltdowns. And when I look back, I still don't know that I know the answer to this. But what I do believe, though, is I think that those were probably more intense rejection sensitivity reactions to what was happening around me, as opposed to an autistic meltdown. But it kind of gives an interesting lens to view my clients through as we're trying to sort through like what exactly is happening and how do we support these needs it's neurodiversity just layers upon layers of all of these different factors that that we need to kind of sort through to support them yeah and rejection sensitivity often has the word dysphoria thrown in on the end of it right and there's folks trying to make it its own deal um which in my mind is both helpful and harmful, sort of, 
it's useful in as far as the concept of rejection sensitivity lets us get a new lens on some struggles. And that part's good. But I think when you try to make it its own thing, you can obfuscate what probably is really going on. Because when it comes to rejection sensitivity, my reading on it is that you're dealing with a kind of a cluster of different things that are all forming Voltron and causing us to have these really strong responses. Neurodivergent, however that is, my jam is ADHD, but that doesn't mean ADHD is the only one that's going to have this happen. But you're neurodivergent, you're, so you're struggling more often, you're failing more often, right? And that early on f- feels like rejection because getting a C- minus or an F on a math test feels like your teacher doesn't like you. I was a teacher. I know. Kids take their grades personally, no matter how much it isn't personal. It's just, that's what you got. <laughs> that's the level you performed at. I don't know what to tell you. Like, it's not, I, it's not that I don't like you. I'm a huge fan. You still failed the test. Um, so some of it is that immaturity and misinterpretation of what happened. But also it's happening more often when we're neurodivergent, whether it's academically or socially or whatever. Then there's also potentially the difficulty in reading social cues. Mm-hmm. That is also going to feel make us feel disconnected from other people, and that's going to make us feel like we're being rejected. Whether we're being rejected or not, we just feel disconnected. We feel like we don't fit in. And layer into that emotional dysregulation challenges. Right. So if I feel like I don't fit in and I'm screwing up in whatever way I happen to be, when I make those mistakes, I'm going to spike higher. And probably, broadly speaking, my base anxiety level is at a higher tier than neurotypical folks because I have more challenges and things are probably a little more chaotic in my house, all of which is upping my baseline anxiety. So I'm that much closer to an amygdala response anyway, and I have difficulty controlling my amygdala. So to me, that's what's going on. That's how I explain this stuff in order to understand what's going on with rejection sensitivity. I don't think it has to be its own thing. And I think calling it its own thing can make it difficult to see what pieces are getting us there. Because any one of those pieces is a place to intervene. I introduced this, obviously, as rejection sensitivity. And I intentionally left that term dysphoria off because it does become, it's useful shorthand for the people who are talking about it. However, it somehow, I think, causes more complications. I've done some research on this, actually, and I was curious about what exactly is going on specifically with ADHDers related to rejection sensitivity. And part of what I found is, first of all, rejection sensitivity is not exclusive to ADHDers. However, there is some neurochemical stuff going on. For example, it's related to the dopamine transmitters, which are the same things that are responsible for motivation and feelings of accomplishment. And dopamine is the chemical that is targeted by some stimulant medications to treat ADHD. So there is a a chemical component to why ADHDers might have a heightened sensitivity to that perceived rejection, but that doesn't mean that it's exclusive there. And, And sometimes I feel like in an effort to be neurodiversity affirming, people find labels for things in order to help people understand. But then I find that sometimes that also comes across as gatekeeping for who is entitled to such and such label or not. And that I don't know. I'm not a big fan of gatekeeping. Right. I was like that. I went through that phase, but I kind of have come out of it. I'm like, everyone just come under the tent. (laughs) As long as you're being nice, come hang out. (laughs) Just like I was just talking about my experience reflecting on my childhood and trying to figure out what was the right label for me (laughs) back then. And I still don't know. I will probably never know. Because I've developed coping skills, I have other, you know, other things going on. How many people don't have access to diagnosis, but know that they need accommodations, they need support? To me, the advantage of a diagnosis is that it eliminates stuff mm-hmm. and it kind of gives you a manual. It gives a, it gives a roadmap. Yeah. And, and if, you, if you know you have ADHD, there's kind of a roadmap in as, in as far as there's a roadmap for anything. But related to that, there's also like, you're, I, the way I phrase it is you're defining your sandbox, right? Like if I get an ADHD diagnosis or an autism diagnosis or a bipolar diagnosis or whatever, 
I know what probably will work within some margin of error, but I also get to find out what's not going to work. And finding out what definitely is not going to work is incredibly empowering, Mm -hmm. provided you can accept that that stuff's not going to work and the people in your life that you have to talk to and work with and deal with can also accept that that stuff is not going to work. Right. So when I realize that I have ADHD and that means that I need to be able to see stuff if I want to do anything with it, it was like a light bulb moment for me. I was like, oh, that's why I don't use filing cabinets because <laughs> they close and I don't see what's inside of them anymore. Right. And there's something about them closing too, where I don't feel like I should open it. Like, I'm not really sure what that's about, but that's in there too. <laughs> but I put stuff on top of the filing cabinet mm-hmm. instead, which is not how you're supposed to use them, but how I use them. That's right. I'm a piler too. Yeah. <laughs> And I was like, oh, but if I get milk crates that I can hang files in, they don't close. So I can still see. And as long as I vary the colors of my files, like the hanging file part, mm-hmm. I'm pretty good at getting in there and taking stuff out and all, all that sort of stuff. And as soon as I figured this out, um, paper kind of became obsolete thanks to like Dropbox and, mm-hmm. <laughs> and Evernote and all that stuff. Um, but- it was still a useful moment for me to go, all right, what works and what doesn't work? And the same is true with rejection and, and sensitivity to rejection. If I know that there's a certain way that I can interact with people that's going to make it a little more gentle for me, I can tell my spouse, my kid, my friend, like, hey, when you talk to me like this, it kills me. But when you use this phrase instead, I'm able to navigate the same criticism, just change your words that pill is going to go down more smoothly for me. So do you mind? And being able to have that kind of a conversation with folks that we trust is pretty powerful. Yeah. That leads right into what my next question is, which is specifically, how can people help the people in their lives, whether it's their children or their partners or their friends or their students, how do we help them overcome those feelings of overwhelm and rejection? Can I give a weird one first? Yeah. Is that okay? Of course. <laughs> Guy Winch wrote a book called Emotional First Aid that talks about how we should learn to like manage emotions in the moment in the same way that we know how to deal with a a cut or a twisted ankle or something. And one of the things he talks about in the book is that rejection lights up the same region of the brains that physical pain lights up and Tylenol and ibuprofen and Advil and stuff help because they dampen that neurological response. Wow. So in the book, he's like, yeah, so if you're going on a job interview, like have an ibuprofen (laughs) and you'll probably do better because you won't be as anxious about being rejected. So I'm not saying like, just take ibuprofen and you won't have rejection sensitivity ever again. Like, that's not what I'm saying. I don't want that to be the takeaway, but it's an interesting piece, right? So if you're going on a job interview, maybe take two ibuprofen before you go on the job interview. Or if you're going on a first date or something like that, where it's heightened. Because taking it all the time is a terrible plan, but like once every six months or something is not a big deal. Um, So that part is fun just as like a cool factoid. Um, And I don't remember the study that he cited, but it was cited in a study and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, The other piece is a lot of managing our rejection sensitivity is our own. It's our own issue. Like it's our head game. It's not their head game. We don't have to ask other people to do the work for us. When we know that we are sensitive to rejection, we can try to talk our way through it, right? Like I said earlier, change the story that you're telling. Intentionally redirect your brain when it starts freaking out and deciding that none of your friends like you because this is the third person you asked to hang out this weekend and no one's around. It doesn't mean they're all hanging out behind your back. It means that they've got stuff going on. Or maybe figure out that you need to ask some follow-up questions. Because that can happen too, right? Where, hey, do you want to hang out on Saturday? No, I've got stuff going on. Oh, okay. And then you just bounce. Even though that person was probably more than willing to tell you what that stuff was, but you ran away really quick in order to avoid the rejection and get out of the situation. And now you don't know what's happening that weekend. Mm -hmm. Get comfortable with follow-up questions. Oh, cool. What are you doing? It might turn out that like they have a basketball tournament that they're playing in 
and so do three of your other friends because they all happen to be in the same basketball league. But that doesn't mean that they're ignoring you. It just means you don't play basketball and they do. Maybe you go to that basketball tournament and you cheer everybody on. Like that's a thing that can happen. So follow-up questions give us more information and allow us to use more of our problem-solving skills and more of our social skills. Sometimes that's anxiety-inducing for us. Sometimes we're like, but what if I do that wrong? What if I screw it up? I recognize that that's there, but you're not going to get better at this stuff if you don't practice it. That's the same way you get better at basketball is the way you get better at social interactions, problem-solving, all that sort of stuff. So some of it is recognizing it's your own head that you have to navigate first, asking some follow-up questions, paying attention to the story that you're telling yourself. And some of it is to find out what your unwritten rules are, because you probably have some and you just need to like challenge them sometimes and don't allow for the rejection in advance. Like I know I've done that. My wife, this is a good one. This is a good like Brendan is a weirdo story. <laughs> <laughs> when my wife and I first started dating, we had this conversation about how when she was in college, she wouldn't do her boyfriend's laundry because it was like his laundry. And he kind of, they had some interaction where he thought she was going to do her his laundry because they lived in the same apartment with a few other roommates. And she was like, no. And so Brendan was like, cool, I will never ask you to do my laundry ever. <laughs> and like, there have been times when I was sick, like a mess, couldn't get out of bed. And was getting out of bed because I needed to do my laundry. I remember this very vividly. <laughs> my wife was like, what are you doing? And I was like, I got to do my laundry. And she was like, you're a mess. Why do you have to do your laundry? And I was like, I don't have any underwear or whatever. <laughs> and she was like, I can do your laundry for you. And I was like, but you said that you would never do my laundry. And she was like, what are you talking about? And now I have to be like, well, like 14 years ago when we were dating... <laughs> You mentioned this one thing. Once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On one occasion. But that's totally me trying to people please, trying to find out what the rules are, trying to avoid rejection. Like all of that stuff is in that story. And people who are sensitive to rejection are doing that kind of stuff. Because if you can figure out what the rules are, you can avoid rejection later. So rather than take the risk of saying, hey, honey, I'm wicked sick and really can't stay out of bed for more than four seconds, do you mind doing my laundry? If she had said no to that, that would have been crushing to me. But I'm not giving her any credit, right? Like I'm not giving my wife the credit of being a caring human being who is going to be more than willing to do my laundry, which of course she is. I wouldn't have married her if she wasn't. But that part of me that's sensitive and vulnerable around rejection avoided that by trying to do my laundry on my own until my wife pointed out that I was an idiot. <laughs> well, as we wrap up, I don't know, maybe that's the best note to leave on. No, as we wrap up, <laughs> you have two sons, right? Are they twins? Do I recall that correctly? Identical twins. Yeah, they're 12 years old. So if you were talking to one of your sons and they were dealing with some rejection sensitivity as their dad, what would you say to them? Um... I might push them to get more rejections to just go not to their friends necessarily, but go to random places and make ridiculous requests to get rejected. Because the more you get rejected, the easier it becomes. Like there's a little bit of exposure therapy there. Um, so I might do that. I, I would certainly ask more questions about why they're feeling rejected to try to find out what's reality and what's perception. I would talk to them about the story that they're telling themselves and try to alter that story. And I would certainly play with the story and get ridiculous with the other side of it, right? I would make a joke about how your friend probably just doesn't like to hang out with people on Tuesdays. Not that my 12-year-olds would get that joke. <laughs> but I would, do, I would do like ridiculous stuff to try to ease that tension, right? And try to ease the difficulty that they're having. And I would also look at the relationship that they're concerned about the rejection inside of, right? That friendship. And I would challenge their perspective. I would point out like, but this is how your relationship with that kid goes. As far as I know, this is all the stuff I'm seeing that seems pretty good and healthy about it. Yeah. And on the other side, if it's valid, if I'm like, yeah, that kid probably doesn't want to hang out with you. I'm going to do that too, right? I'm going to say like, 
and typically they don't, don't really want to hang out with that kid either. And that's important too, because sometimes we get really sensitive about being rejected by people that we don't even want to hang out with or spend time with. Mm. So that matters in there as well, right? Like they might reject me because I have ADHD or I'm neurodivergent. So that person might not hire me to do the job. Well, do you want to work with that person anyway, if they're going to not hire you? Probably not. So that's in there too, when we're feeling rejected, but, but it's kind of good because mm-hmm. it's not a good match. That matters as well. Brendan, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thank you, Emily. The reactions to rejection can be debilitating for kids and adults who struggle with emotional regulation. Telling someone to toughen up or don't let it bother you isn't as easy when your brain interprets rejection as intensely and realistically as physical pain. Rejection sensitivity can lead to imposter syndrome or avoidance of situations one perceives as risky. It undermines self-efficacy and ultimately, it can lead a person to underperform or feel socially isolated. Toxic positivity isn't the solution, it rarely is. But having somebody acknowledge the emotions as valid and real is powerful. Asking for clarification about a person's intent when we get that punched in the gut feeling of being rejected can provide some quick relief when we discover that their true intent was innocuous. Taking control of our own narrative or choosing what story to tell ourselves about a situation can also help us get through those intense emotions. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. As 2021 comes to an end, we'd like to thank you for making it a year of incredible growth for us. Please continue to tell others. Thanks to the musicians who contribute to our podcast, without whom we'd just be a voice. As we move into 2022, we do so with optimism that it will be a better year for all of us. We could certainly use the change. The host of our podcast is Emily Kircher Morris. The post-production editor and executive producer is me, Dave Morris. And for all of us here, thanks and Happy New Year. This is a production of Morris Creative Services.